I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. 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 We're honored to have you here. The, this started when last night we were having dinner. And he said, well, what's the format of the program? And we've been engaging in a great conversation and we'll continue. And I said, well, the program is this. Jerome's going to introduce you. You're going to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll open it up to questions. And he said, well, that's fine. But I think we should just continue the conversation that we're having for dinner. So here I am, drafted by how we find it. So let's start with, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, tell us about this book. Why did you write it? What prompted it? Well, thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Thanks for, for the invite. It's been, once again, it's an honor to be here. I've done this uh, tour of Bob, uh, thank you, of the Clinton Library. And so it's just been, it's, it's pretty special to be here. Uh, I think that, uh, I think more than anything, that the, the reason for doing the book was simply looking at our culture. It, I always take on projects that, that strike me as interesting. And really, it happened, I think, in the 20... I think it was the 2013 Super Bowl. Ravens 49ers, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember watching that Super Bowl, which was a terrible game at first, and then it turned into a pretty good game. I just put power out during that game, I think. And, I had noticed looking at the commercials, because Super Bowl commercials, of course, tell us everything that we need to know about the culture. Right? Um, virtually every commercial had an American flag in it. It had either an American flag in it, or it had a police officer, or a military, and it was like, okay, what are they selling us right now? Every, whatever the product was, it's a bag of Doritos, and there was a flag there. So it struck me, and I don't know why the connection hit, because obviously this was three years before Colin Kaepernick had, ever, had even done anything. I don't know why that was the Super Bowl that did it or why that stretch of ads that did it, but it, it just hit me. And what hit me was we have not reconciled 9-11, that we are st all of this is still a byproduct of what happened on September 11th, that it has now become embedded into our marketing it's embedded into our sports. It's embedded into the culture and how we sell sports. And then the next year, of course, Ferguson happens. And this was obviously a year after Trayvon Martin and the Miami Heat had donned their hoodies and things and suddenly you saw athletes doing things that they hadn't done in a long time, which was to actually get involved. I used to say that the, the athletes were spending so much time behind the tinted glass of their Escalades, but now they were getting it they were actually taking a political position or an, a social position. And then after Ferguson and then Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and all of these dash cam videos with, with police encounters with the black community, suddenly you saw athletes doing something that we hadn't seen in a very long time. And to have that collide with the commercials and to collide with the fact that you know, you're watching a, a baseball game on Tuesday, which nobody cares about, and yet there's a, an American flag the, entire, you know, the size of the entire outfield. I just started to ask the question, what's happening? What's taking place right now? And so that was really the, the genesis of it, and you began to sort of see this collision of images and actions, and then that doesn't even include the fact that, and then, you know, in 2016, Colin took his knee, and then, of course, that's during a presidential election, and then, of course, you have the president taking on the athletes directly, and then, of course, things have sort of cascaded from there, but that was really the genesis of it. Well, last night when we were uh, having dinner, he kept checking his phone. <laughs> and I finally said... Because I'm not rude at all. No, right? it was fine. No, it, you know, it was, it was fine. Uh, those that know me know that I don't have a phone to check. So, uh, so it was... Uh, so I said, okay, okay, look, Howard, I mean, how are the Eagles doing? And he said, I'm not looking for the Eagles. I'm following Serena. And then he... Went, so, and then after, after she won impressively... He, a few minutes later, he was back on the phone looking. He said, I said, okay, what's the Eagles score? He said, I'm not following the Eagles. I'm looking for Serena's uh, opponent. So 
before we get into, because she is also featured in, in the Nike ad, mm -hmm. would you talk briefly, because you've made some very uh, powerful statements, the role of Serena in sports and women? Yeah, it's actually funny. One of the things that happens when you write a book, and it's one of the reasons why I, my authors are so neurotic, is you always look and see where you failed. And where in the book did you hit the bullseye? Where did you miss the bullseye? Because once it's out, you can't do anything about it anyway. And somebody is going to remind you where you didn't hit the bullseye. And I think one of the things in, in this book that hit me specifically was the role of women in this heritage. We spend a lot of time talking about Paul Robeson to Muhammad Ali and Jackie Robinson and Tommy Smith and John Carlos, but we don't really talk a lot about the women and who are the women of this heritage. And we talk about, you know, you know about the, the Billie Jean Kings and Althea Gibsons for the most part, but what about in a contemporary sense? And to me, Rachel Robinson obviously is the, one of the most important of uh, people involved in this, which is why I, I wrote extensively about her in the book, because without Rachel Robinson, we're not talking about Jackie Robinson today. I think that Jackie Robinson would have been obscured to history in a lot of ways. She made sure that everybody kept his memory alive. And then I started to think as well about what took place. Why don't we have more women in this book other than me just not doing more of what I should have been doing. But it was also something else, that women athletes are far more vulnerable than the male athletes because they don't play team sports. We don't necessarily have that. They're, it's not a multi-billion dollar team sport industry. The WNBA players were far more, far more direct in taking on as a team some of these issues of racial injustice. The Minnesota Lynx, they all came out black, white as a team. And if you look at male team sports, it's a black male issue. You don't see any white players really get involved. Maybe Chris Long with the Philadelphia Eagles. But for the most part, it's the, the, the white players deal with this as a black issue. It's their issue. You don't see Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or any of those guys get involved. But the women got involved together, which is what sports and teamwork is supposed to be all about. But then you also realize that when it comes to the money, the average salary for a WNBA player is about $64,000. The average salary for an NBA player is $6 million. So the players, the male players, have protection. The male, LeBron James makes $35.6 million a year. So, and by the way, as we talked about last night, that $35.6 million is guaranteed. He's not a football player where if he gets hurt, they cut him and he's out of his money. All of that money is guaranteed. However, if you're Serena Williams, or if you're Sloane Stevens, or if you're any female athlete, or if you're Simone Biles, you make your money off of sponsorships for the most part. And if you take a political position, the sponsors are gonna undermine you. And your, your ability to earn is going to be immediately impacted. So the female athlete is in such a more difficult position, which makes it interesting when some of them actually do take a stand. Does Serena have the opportunity to do more? Sure, she absolutely does. But one of the reasons why you have this sort of imbalance is because most of the women play individual sports. And if they challenge the culture, as we've seen how quickly sponsorships get pulled from people who do things that are considered controversial, then they're really gonna hurt themselves in the wallet as well, regardless of what their politics may be. But Serena's impact on the sport is monumental. Yeah, no question, no question. And I think that what she's done now is very, very clever in terms of, in terms of cultivating a, a certain level of fan. And, and, and let's not forget, if you go back and look at Serena and Venus's history, they have taken unbelievable amounts of abuse. Even though they are, in my opinion, the greatest pair of siblings ever to play sports. All sports. Anybody want to challenge that? Um, maybe Peyton, maybe the Mannings, but they're not even close. I mean, these two, in term, whether it's singles, doubles, Olympics, championships, whatever measure, you, there's nobody better. There's no sport has ever produced you know, from the same family what those two have done. And so when you think about that impact, uh, it is, 
staggering. And I think that what I, what I find most encouraging about what Serena is doing now is that, and I'm very skeptical of corporations. We'll get into that in a minute. I really don't, I'm not sure I believe anything that I see because you're selling products. But at the same time, the ability for her to be in our faces and the ability to bring the corporation, which is usually very reluctant, to force them to move in a direction that the public wants is pretty powerful. Because at some point, when you really think about corporations, all they're doing is following what the public wants. When they see the public in the street, then Nike's thinking, oh, maybe there's a marketing opportunity here. But it's because the public is in the street. It's not because they're bringing the public to the street. When they're trying to make money off of patriotism, it's not because they're drawing people toward it, it's because they see people carrying tiny American flags and they feel like there's a marketing opportunity there. So I think where Serena's power really does come from is the fact that she's so good and she's so inspirational and she's so unique and now she's on the verge of becoming the third mother to win fourth mother, to win a chance to win a grand slam. That's gonna bring even more people toward her platform, toward what she can actually bring. And then we watch and see what she does with it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's gonna be a great match. Uh, now, so <laughs> the, big, the big kahuna in the room is the Nike ad. And the big story, even though Serena's in that ad, is, is, uh, is the uh, former quarterback of the San Francisco mm -hmm. 49ers. So, Who, by the way, sent me a text right before it happened. It was like bizarre. You got a text from him right before the ads? Before like an hour before the launch, I get a text from Colin saying, something big's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sent a message back saying, cliffhanger? How about some, let me, let, let me break a story. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, you got a story and a... Uh, tip on a text from that's right. Maybe you could advise the White House a little bit on how to get the, and how to, and how at least to you got, that, at least right? you got a source on that one. Okay, here's the here. It was not here, anonymous. Here, here. Okay, but, but let's let, let's talk let's talk about let's talk about the Nike the, let's talk about the Nike ad. And so we look at it as the the politics of patriotism, the politics of protest. The marketing of patriotism, mm -hmm. the marketing of protest. So, you know, would you analyze the, the Nike ad from, from your own personal perspective, and then how do you see it playing out? Well, you know, when I first heard it was coming, Colin sent me the text. I was waiting to see what was going to happen, and then all of a sudden, then you know, you started to see it on see it on Twitter, and you started to see what was what was coming, and then of course you saw the ad, and the ad bothered me to be honest when I first watched it because I didn't see. I didn't see the protest element. I saw it inspirational. I said, okay, this is an inspirational thing. Be your best you. Okay, that's fine. But I didn't see anything in the ad that told us why he did what he did or told us why he had been ostracized from his profession. So I was wondering if what was really taking place is if there was a rehabilitation of Colin Kaepernick without bringing the idea of protest and without bringing the idea that motivated him in the first place along with it. So what's the value of this if we're still not going to talk about police and accountability? What happens there? That's the reason why we're talking about Colin in the first place. So are we watching something that becomes transitional? Are we watching uh, a figure become inspirational instead of accountable? Was he defanged by this? These are all the questions that started to come to my mind. And then it also hit me about Nike wanting to have it both ways. And I began to think about whether or not we were being manipulated as a public, as we're always manipulated as a public. On the one hand, you've got one corporation, the National Football League, that is profiting off of patriotism. And that is essentially blackballing a football player because they don't believe that he is an asset to their industry even though he is capable of performing. On the other hand, you have another corporation, Nike, profiting off of patriotism, I'm sorry, off of uh, protest, because they see an opportunity there. So then you put the two together and you realize that Nike and the NFL are business partners, that Nike provides the uniforms and all the gear for the NFL. 
So then you hop on the Nike.com website and you see that Nike gives police officers a 10 to 15% discount on clothing. So it's like, what is this all about? So okay, Nike's got both sides covered, great. Okay, now what? So I had a lot of thoughts about that. And I thought about that neither patriotism nor protest should be for sale. That this is not what we're talking about here. When you're talking about caring about your country and wanting your country to be better and wanting the way you live and the way your children live to be better, I don't want a pair of sneakers about that. It's got nothing to do with sneakers or jerseys or anything. Nor does accountability when it comes to some police-involved shooting or officer-involved shooting, as they call them. So uh, I was very skeptical of, of this. And as we talked last night, and you know, we keep talking about this dinner, but we didn't bring any food for you, so I apologize. It was very good. <laughs> it's a good restaurant. Um, your point was an excellent one, which was that from a protest standpoint or from a news standpoint or just from a, an activism standpoint, is it enough that Nike is putting this person who the NFL was trying to bury, to put him in your face, just to make you say, you're gonna have to deal with him even if they don't let him play. That you're gonna have to deal with his voice on these commercials whenever you're watching your football game. He's still there even though he's not there. Is there value in that? And that was a great perspective, and I think that there is, and I am softening my stance on this a little bit. On the, I lobbied Howard Bryant and won. <laughs> right? I mean, and so I think that there is a lot to be said for that in terms of when you question, I mean, what is value? What is the value of any of this? On the other hand, is there value in the rehabilitation of Colin Kaepernick simply for Colin Kaepernick without the issues that brought him to the table in the first place? What happens to us? What happens to justice? What happens to the reasons why people supported him? Do you have to have both? I kind of think that you do. Well, this issue has attracted, obviously, uh, as you noted, uh, a lot of activity from President Trump. Uh, Arkansas native Jerry Jones feels very strongly on one side of the issue. Arkansas native and renowned general Wesley Clark feels very strongly on the other side of the issue. How, what, what do you see about the but we talk about the politics of patriotism and protest, but what do you see about the long range of this beyond just this one particular ad? Well, it's, what's really interesting when you work on a book project, and we were talking about this and having lunch, is that the book, books exist in three stages. The first stage of the book is it belongs to you. It's your book, it's you and your house and you and your laptop trying to figure out if these sentences make sense. Most times they don't. Um, the second stage is it belongs to the publisher. And then it's the negotiation between you and the publisher about what's going to appear. And then the third stage is, is it belongs to the public. It belongs to you. That's not my book anymore. It's yours. You can read it. You can not read it. You can trash it. You can love it. You can do whatever you want to do with it because I can't change it anymore. So that part is gone for me, sadly. Or actually happily because I'm glad I don't have to do it anymore, right? Um, <laughs> but the publisher when we started to conceptualize what this book was gonna be, they were really, really interested in the rise of the athlete and the return of the athlete because you had Ali and you had Jackie Robinson and you had these inspirational figures and then they disappeared. And then all of a sudden LeBron with Trayvon comes back. They were interested in that arc. I was interested in that arc, but I didn't feel like you could tell this story without patriotism without 9-11, without looking at what was happening in the culture, that why were these sports leagues so hell-bent on punishing these players? And what is happening to the business model when you are selling not just the game, but you're also selling deference to authoritarian symbols? Because the relationship with the police in some communities is not the same as the relationship in others. And what happens when you're forcing people to sing God Bless America at a sporting event, while at the same time telling the athlete to stick to sports when none of this has anything to do with sports? So the publisher didn't want the patriotism part in the book. I'm glad I won that argument. 
because this is actually what is taking place in the culture right now. And you're talking about the Jerry Jones versus Wesley Clark thing where Wesley Clark came out and said, as a general, I'm not offended by Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. And then on the other hand, you have Jerry Jones saying, anyone who takes a knee will not play for my football team. And that brings out all of these questions that we talk about, about what do you want your culture to look like? What do you want your country to be? Are we okay with denying employment of people that we don't like? Is that what we do? Is that who we are? And I brought this up to you last night and you didn't like what I had to say about it, where I said, maybe that is who we are now. Maybe that's what we've become post 9-11 in a post-terrorism world, that there are certain things that we have to all adhere to and that this other piece of American individualism gets taken away. It's kind of a scary thought, but maybe that's what we're becoming. Especially the other day when you have the president saying, well, I don't think we should have protesters. So maybe this is what's happening to us right under our noses in a place where people like to watch a bouncing ball for three hours. And I think that was the part of this that I thought was really interesting, was that this is the place where, you know, you like the Red Sox, I like the Yankees, or you're a Cowboys fan, and I'm an Eagles fan, and we hug it out afterwards, and it's just a game. But it's really not just a game anymore, because this is being sold, you know, these attitudes are being sold in a room, in an arena of 70,000 people being beamed out to everyone. That's a powerful, powerful marketing tool, which is what is a roundabout way of me getting to the military part of this. I had a wonderful conversation with uh, General Russell Honore. And people know him down in New Orleans, part of the Katrina cleanup. He's a tremendous three-star general. He's unbelievably funny and really, really smart. And, we, and, and I talked to him about how the fact that undergirding this patriotism at the, at the sporting events is the fact that the military is actually paying for this. These are not organic. These are not organic displays of caring for the troops. This is the Department of Defense paying millionaire sports teams to sell and recruit at sporting events. And I said to him, I said, well, General, I am not sure, and my son was 13 at the time, I said, I'm not sure I want my 13-year-old being recruited by the Army because he's watching the Red Sox. And the general said to me, well, that's too bad because we only get two out of every 10 that qualify and we cannot get this kind of advertising anywhere else. So if some kid watching a Dallas Cowboys game sees an F-14 fly over and that motivates them to join the armed forces, well, we can't get that kind of PR anywhere else. So hold on to them SOBs as long as you can. And I thought that was amazing. I thought it was amazing because of the candor. They're not hiding this. The sports leagues are hiding it because they never tell you that this stuff is being paid for by the Army or the National Guard. That, the, that NASCAR gave Richard Petty $1.5 million just to shake hands with troops. And yet you see it on TV and you go, hey, hey, look, you know, there's number 43 out there shaking hands with you. No, that's not what's happening here. So to answer your question, this is, a, this is a central battle in terms of determining who gets to win sort of the attitude of the day. They call it a culture war. But at the same time, the NBA does a really good job of just letting basketball, for the most part, be basketball and allowing people who have their opinions have their opinions. LeBron James and Steph Curry can call the president a bum if he likes, and Kevin McHale can go to a Trump rally, and nobody cares. So why is that sport so good at, a, at having both and allowing this country to be what it's always been? And why is the NFL going out of its way to destroy these players? It's a really interesting question. And to me, the answer is, of course, labor. Basketball contracts are guaranteed, football contracts are not. And I love when I say this to players in football because they don't even know their own sport. When I tell them that the contracts are guaranteed, I remember one player said to me, 100% guaranteed? And I was like, what part of guarantee don't you get? <laughs> guarantee means guaranteed. Partial guarantee means something less. But the NFL player is always pitted against the other NFL player because their labor situation is so different. Their labor situation is, is such that they are susceptible to a divide and conquer strategy. 
whereas NBA players aren't. One of the things you said last night, and I think this guaranteed contract, because we were talking about, I, I, I just asked you about Kaepernick, and, and, because once he was released, how much did he bank? How much did he have? And you, you said you thought he had somewhere between 30 and 40 million guaranteed uh, that he that he put. He signed away. a 114 million dollar deal, I think, and I think 30, 35 of that was guaranteed. So it was essentially a 35 million dollar contract. So however, however much of that he still has is the money that he earned. So so basketball is guaranteed. So LeBron's is guaranteed. Baseball is guaranteed. One of the, th- the thing we got the one of the most interesting things you were talking about last night, and and, and I think needs to be raised is that only two <laughs> percent. You, the, the number you two percent of the college baseball players on college campuses are African American. Yep. Only two percent. So, and then we'll go to question from the audience. But give me a trajectory from the sports experts' point of view. Where do you see professional baseball? Where do you see professional football? Where do you see professional basketball? Just. 15, 10, 15 years down the road? Well, I think that one of the things that you're going to try to, that I think that the players want, some of the more radical players, the Carmelo Anthony's and LeBron's and some of those guys, obviously I think they want to fight. It's always going to be a labor fight. It's always owners versus players because it's a business. And that's how it works. And you've got this kind of, you know, you've got a 10, 12, 15 billion dollar pie being split up and everybody wants their share. And nobody goes to a ball game to watch an owner. But at the same time, The owners are the ones taking the financial risk, so they're constantly battling with each other. But when you bring up that 2% number, the reason why that was important to me was because one of the subtexts of the book is the black body versus the black brain. And that, to me, the reason why you talk about this heritage, why are we talking about this, why is it important that LeBron James sticks up for his community but nobody is asking Cal Ripken Jr. or Aaron Rodgers or Matt Ryan to do the same? Why is that important? Well, the reason is because the argument that I make in this book is that the black athlete is the most important, the most influential, the most visible black employee this country's ever produced. That they are the ones who made it. And when you look at the pipeline from slavery to sharecropping to legitimacy or whatever you want to call it, especially to education, It was the athletes who were integrating the white universities, not the big brain black doctors. They were still going to HBCUs. So our value came from the athlete. It was Jackie Robinson who integrated before the military integrated. It was Paul Robeson playing college at at Rutgers. And so there's an importance that the black athlete has that nobody else has in our culture. Like one of the things, and I was working on the book and trying to conceptualize, you had these wonderful arguments with friends of mine who were like, are you really gonna tell me that Michael Jordan is more important than Prince? I'm like, are we really having this debate right now? Um, Are you gonna say that, that LeBron James is more important than Michael Jackson? And I said, absolutely I am, and here's the reason. We embed the eradication of racism with sports. It's in our language. We want to level the playing field. When you talk about integration, Duke Ellington could always play at the Cotton Club even if he couldn't eat there or stay there. But you needed a movement to integrate pro sports. You needed a movement to integrate team sports. Because if you could integrate team sports, if you and I can be in the same team, if you can play shortstop and I can play second base and then we can be on the road together and then we can shower together and we can win and lose together, then why can't we go to the same schools? And why can't we live next door to each other? Then the whole thing collapses. And that's not true of music. Nobody talks about music as this sort of gateway to an integrated, free, fair, even society, but we do it with sports all the time. So that gives this athlete, especially the athlete who is beginning to be more and more prominent for people in the black community to say, hey, we need you. We need you to stand up for issues that are important to us because you're the one who made it. And going back to the 2% question, we now reach a point in sports where this black body was supposed to become the black brain. And we say, well, even if you blow out your knee, you're still going to be on a college campus and you're going to get the college experience. But now we're not even sure that they're being educated at all. So now we've come full circle and now we say, well, we know it's a $10 billion industry in the NCAA, so just pay the players. We're not even going to have a pretense anymore 
that they're being educated. So let's just give them the money. And I waver back and forth on that. I think they should have both. But what do we do with that? And so this entire question still brings us full circle to the, the, this is the reason why the athlete is important. And the athlete is important because the athlete is undergirding a, a, a multi-billion dollar industry at the college level, a multi-billion dollar industry at the pro level, and yet the attitude from the White House, from Main Street, from a lot of people, is to tell these guys to shut up and play. That they don't have the right to speak when in this country we know that the more money you have, they're the ones we listen to. But the player who has as much money as anyone, we don't want them to speak. Why can't they speak? Everybody else speaks. Okay, we're going to open the question. The first question comes from Clinton School student Ben Washington. Ben, you're up. Wait for the, here comes the So how do you reconcile the balancing act of uh, speaking so honestly on black issues and the uh, fragility of some groups when faced with that honesty? Yeah, the general, my general response to that is I don't care. Um, I can't care. And, and the reason is because I have this conversation with friends all the time when somebody, and I don't mean to be a jerk about it really, I really don't. Um, when someone sends you a nice letter about something that you wrote, and then I'm, I'm thankful for it, obviously, and grateful that you did something that somebody appreciated. But if you're not overjoyed about it, people look at you like, you're, like you don't care. And I'm like, well, I can't necessarily care that much because I can't care more if you like what I wrote against if you didn't like what I wrote. Because then what ends up happening is, is that you end up writing for the reaction. And if you write for the reaction, you're not being true to the subject matter, and you're not being true to yourself. What you're doing is, I need to make sure that everybody in this room likes what I say. And now, all of a sudden, that changes the motivation for what you're doing. Because if you do what we do, you're going to run into subjects that people aren't going to like. You're going to run into subjects that the subjects aren't going to like. Did I really say that? Yeah, you kind of did, right? So it happens all the time. So the most important thing that you can do is be true to your subject matter and be true to the reasons why you take an interest in what you're taking an interest in. I find myself, like my first book was about the history of race in the Boston Red Sox. And every time I'm down in, in the South, I always have to remind people, yeah, I'm from Boston, so we kind of have our own reputation, right? <laughs> and um, it's funny because when I worked on that book, the first thing people said was, oh my God, you're going to write about race and baseball. No one's going to talk to you. And then when I worked on my second book, which was about the history of PEDs and baseball, and anabolic steroids and baseball, people said, oh my God, are you going to talk about steroids? No one's going to talk to you. And then, of course, my next book was on Hank Aaron. Everybody loved Hank Aaron, so that was okay. But... This last book, someone said the same thing. Well, if you write about you know, cops and patriotism and military, no one's going to talk to you. But you know what ends up happening? Every single time you do these subjects, there's another subset of people who say it's about time. Because everyone's thinking about these subjects. We are all living these subjects. And I think there's value in thinking about them a different way. And as we talked about over lunch, if, there is a, if you really, really, really want to read about the heroism of police, there are plenty of things out there for you. There are plenty of projects out there. If you want to read about the athletes and why they did what they do, then maybe you'll learn something from this. But I think that's the beauty of what we do. Yes, I've got a question at the back. Then we'll come up here at the front. Up the back, at the back, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Hi, my name's Hillary. Thank you so much for being here. This is Hillary here. I know it's it's, it's a natural. <laughs> you should have been first. It's crazy. <laughs> I work here too, so that's even cooler. Um, I'm curious about this NBA NFL um, tension, and it, you kind of talk about the NBA like they're so good at letting these athletes be how we've always been. But if this contract situation was different, and I if they had more power to fire these athletes, 
Do you think it would be different? Do you think the MBA is innately like, yeah, we're, we're good with this because it's all American, or are their hands tied? And can you talk a little bit, like, what is it actually about the NFL is it, that's making them make it so hard for these? It's two questions, kind of. I'm just, like, digging into that. Is the NFL inherently racist? Evil. Racist, evil, racist, all uh, of the above. Okay, um, yeah, I think it's power. It's, it, it comes down to power. I think that, number one, the NFL owners have made it very, very clear if you go back and look at opensecrets.org or wherever you want to go to find when you start digging into people's lives, because that's what we sort of do for a living, is the amount of money that they've given to certain political candidates. And they've backed that up. And so there's that. But I think that to answer your question about the NBA, the NBA has always, I don't want to say always, I'd say for the last 30, 35 years, have done an amazing job adapting to the people who play their sport. And that's one of the things that baseball does a terrible job of. Baseball makes you adapt to the baseball culture, which is why so many kids are like, I don't want to do this, because baseball makes you become, what do we always say, like, you, know, the, you adapt to the culture before the culture adapts to you. The basketball, and I think it was because they were on the verge of bankruptcy in the late 1970s, they realized that they had to adapt to the people playing the game. And the combination of Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and of course the ubiquity of Michael Jordan with the Air Jordans and the sneakers and the whole thing in basketball, has become such a very cool, hip culture outside of the NBA that the NBA realized, we're crazy if we don't adopt this into our company, you know, into our business model. If the NBA was really resistant to the fact that people like to do windmill dunks now, and they do all kinds of crazy, acrobatic, fun things, like the NFL does, like when the NFL wouldn't let you celebrate in the end zone. If they you know, made sure that they were trying to really tamp down the individualism of the player, I think we'd be having the same conversation about basketball. Also the fact that the NBA is 80% black. So the, the volume of the workforce in the NBA, although the NFL is 70% black, but the difference between the NFL and the NBA in terms of that, that demographic is division of labor. The NFL division of labor is so strong in that the quarterbacks are so much more important than the centers who are so much more important than the long snapper. So when you have that division of labor as, uh, you know, being as stark as it is, you can divide and conquer the workforce. Whereas in the NBA, there's one Michael Jordan, there's one LeBron James, and they have so much power. They have so much power off the court, they have so much control on the court. You have to listen to them. Yeah, they're, the, the NBA player is, bulletproof in a lot of ways, until, of course, their talent begins to decline, and then they get attacked as well. Yeah, right here. Wait for the, wait for the microphone, then we'll, come, then we'll go back to the back. Um, I'm, uh, my cousin's wife is Betty Shelby, yeah. and the reason I came here today with that, my cousin has told me about training for cops, so that leads me to my question. There was a lot of stuff, Colin Kaepernick, Carmelo Anthony and others said that wasn't true about that shooting, and it was proven 60 minutes, the trial, and other places. What holds these athletes accountable when they pen art op-ed articles or do other things when the facts come out that disprove what they said originally? Well, that's a good question. I think that the most important thing when you're looking at these cases, and whether you're talking about Betty Shelby or Terrence Crusher or Philando Castile or Alton Sterling or Eric Garner, the list goes on and on and on, is one thing. Certainly, I'm not going to relitigate what happened that day in Tulsa. However, I think that the issue is this. No matter how many times you look at that video, how many times I look at that video, I conclude one thing. I did not see anything that told me that the only option that day was to kill that man. And that's what the players are fighting. And that's what you see in the videos, and that's what you look at to me. And nobody is arguing that being a police officer is a hard job. No one is arguing that point. What you're arguing is when you watch these videos and you look at the attitudes and you read the attitudes of a lot of these police unions across the country where the training is either ignored or there's no accountability when it comes to acquit when it comes to acquittals and convictions. You're asking yourself, 
have we reached a point in this country where confrontations with police reach a point where the option is compliance or death. There's nothing in between. And on top of that, if you look at the video of Daniel Shaver in Mesa, Arizona, who was a white man laying on his stomach, being told that he was gonna have his life ended when he was receiving confusing commands, and then they shot him. And so the argument is not necessarily what takes place on some of these individual cases. The argument is more, have we reached a point in this country where the officers believe that confrontations need to end in death and where the culture is comfortable with that and where the juries are comfortable with that. And that, to me, is really the main reason for a lot of these protests. Yes, question at the back, and then we'll come up here. The comment about the 2% uh, of college players in baseball being black should be no surprise for anyone in this room. Name me the one black player that plays for the University of Arkansas. When the University of Arkansas takes the field, the opponents might have more black players than they do. My question is, is there some subtle reference to the brain power that you spoke of? <coughs> that it takes, you gotta be smarter to play baseball than to play basketball or football. Well, and that's that, an argument that, oh, I'm sorry, were you done with your question? No, no, I'm done. Oh, you know, we've dealt with that for a long time. Remember that the reason why there weren't as many black quarterbacks was because we supposedly weren't smart enough. The reason why you don't have a lot of black centers, not smart enough to navigate the offensive line, same for middle linebacker, same for catchers. Would catchers be able to, would a, would a black catcher, would a white pitcher listen to a black catcher in terms of calling a game? These arguments are, have been there for a really long time and there's no argument that those elements exist. However, I don't believe that's the real answer. The real answer is this. If you look for players, you are going to find them. And in the 1940s and the 1950s, where did baseball look for talent? They were out here in Arkansas and out here in, in Oklahoma and out you know, beating the bushes looking for players. And they were going to the Negro Leagues because the Negro Leagues were the, were the cheapest source of black talent. Willie Mays signed his first contract for $5,000. Hank Aaron signed his first contract for $6,000. Today, the cheapest source of talent is the Dominican Republic. So essentially what baseball has become is it's a middle class white sport compounded by foreign labor. When I was covering the Oakland A's in 1998, they signed Miguel Tejada a couple years earlier for $2,000. $2,000. That same year they signed Mark Mulder in the amateur draft for $3 million. And the only difference is that one was American and one was Dominican. So when you look at baseball, you can take an amateur pool of a million dollars and you can buy thousands of Dominican players and have them under your control. Whereas a million dollars in the American amateur draft will not buy you one American player. So, because of that, they also have something in baseball called finished products and unfinished products. Back in the day when we were all growing up baseball, they didn't want you to play baseball at college because the teams wanted you, they wanted to teach you how to play the game. They didn't want you to learn your swing from somebody in college and they wanted you to be trained completely under the umbrella of that organization. If the Cardinals, the Yankees, they had the huge farm systems, they wanted to develop players. Today, because the economics of the game are so imperative, Baseball wants players to come faster. They don't have time to develop you, so now they want the colleges to develop you, but baseball's a non-revenue sport in college. So the black athletes who need the money to get to college are playing the revenue sports, football and basketball. So if you can afford, if you really, really, really love baseball and you can afford to get yourself to the University of Arkansas because they don't have necessarily as many scholarships, okay, you can try to be the one black player who's gonna play here. 
But for the most part, if you need a scholarship and you're an athlete, you're gonna go who's gonna pay you to play. And so that's why baseball right now is in the middle of trying to battle with the NCAA trying to fund scholarships. And so if you get more, if you can fund the scholarships, then maybe baseball can raise its number of black players. But this is an economic issue. You look for talent, you find the talent, and baseball is looking for talent in two places. They're looking in college, and they're looking overseas. Yes, ma'am, we got a question right up here. Hi, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, you spoke about uh, guaranteed uh, salaries and non-guaranteed salaries and the black body and the black brain. And I've felt that NFL has been a gladiator sport in that um, the black body is expendable. and. Um, if a salary isn't guaranteed, then that's great because you see a player being wheeled off the field in a gir on a gurney or in a golf cart, and another one is right behind him, and so many injuries uh, end um, careers and lives, for that matter, and I just wonder if you feel the same way about the NFL being... A gladiator sport. Well, it's definitely a gladiator, gladiator sport, and on top of it being a gladiator sport, I called it a death sport, and my employer didn't like it that much. Um, <laughs> but it still made the paper. Um, I look at it a couple of ways. One, you're 100% right, and I think that one of the areas where this is such a difficult part for me is patriotism. And when we look at what we've done, when you look at what the president has done, when you look at what I mean, even in the public, a lot of people, you know, black, white, whatever, who don't like this whole question of kneeling and everything else. Where I'm going with this is this. When you take black body over black brain, when you take using your body to prove yourself, and when you look at the demographics of the military, military is more black and brown, it's as black and brown as the NFL. So the players, have more in common with the military, even though they're being called unpatriotic. Because both sides, whether you're a kid, when the, the, so many people, there was maybe, I'm trying to think of somebody who told me in my project that they joined the armed forces because of a deep love of country. They wanna go through school. They wanted somebody to pay for college. I was trying to get a better life. This was the pathway to get to college. That's why they joined the Army. That's why they joined the Air Force. And so now you've got this dynamic, and it's this bizarre sort of economic battle where you've got the $10 million black athlete who is essentially saying, I made it. I'm a gladiator. I am willing to risk my brain I'm willing to risk the statistics that tell me that I'll be dead by 60. I'm willing to risk all of that for the money that I'm being paid. And they connect in so many ways with the 18, 19 year old who doesn't have a lot of options, who joins the Air Force because there's a way for them to get an education. And yet, in this entire story, we are painting these two as opposites when they're really not opposite. And I, I think you're 100% right. Chris Carter and I, the former wide receiver with the uh, Vikings and the Eagles, we had it out one day on the air. And it was not pretty. And so we're walking out of the green room one day and I said to him, I said, Chris, knowing what you know now, knowing that the statistics are going to tell you that you have a very high chance of being incapacitated or dead by 59. Are you still willing to do what you do? And he said, 100%. He said, because my 60 years are gonna be more exciting than your 80. And I said, see me on your 58th birthday. <laughs> so absolutely, what is taking place here, the players know, it's a, it's, your body is, 
is at stake here. Okay, we've got, let's see. Do you have, Jerome, you got a question right here? All right. We've mentioned the position of black athletes in professional sports. Uh, can you talk about briefly the lack of black ownership in the NFL and the presence of it in the NBA and how the cultures defer because of that ownership? Yeah, no question, and I'll be fast because I know that I don't know how we're doing on time, but I hate the fact that people have questions and can't answer them, so. They can, they can visit with you when they I'll buy be, their book. I will be quicker with my answers. Um, 100% the ownership piece of this. This is what it's supposed to translate to. Carmelo Anthony and I had this conversation the same day he told me that the Betty Shelby thing was an execution. We were in the back of his car, and we're driving, and he says to me that the player is the idiot here. The player needs to recognize that we have enough power to start our own leagues. We have enough power to challenge this entire system. But most players are comfortable being handed $10 million and being willing to risk nothing. They don't want to risk anything. So the real next step when people say, where do you see this thing going, is I think that guys like LeBron James, whose, whose net worth is almost, it's a half a billion dollars now, he's 32 years old. I think that his next step, and I think the next step of these players is to find some way to begin to have player-owned teams. I don't know what this does for the entire universe, but I know it shifts the balance of power in sports. Okay, we got time for one more question. This is Phyllis right here. This, uh, Howard, this is Phyllis Brown. Uh, she is the sister of Minnie Jean Brown Tricky of the Little oh, Rock really, Nine. Little Rock. So have at it, Phyllis. Thank you. Governor Orville Faubus closed the schools in 1958 in an attempt to not integrate Central High or the schools in Little Rock. However, the football team remained. <laughs> <laughs> so is football more important than education? Money is more important than everything. Oh, it's money. <laughs> And, it's money. Okay. Well, and when we get to it, um, when you think about it, go to Missouri in 2016. These players actually decided that they were going to challenge that system, that the players were going to say, "Look, we're going to." They were having racial issues on campus, and that they were going to stick with the student union, and that the players were going to actually use their power. And where did the players have the most power? The football team. And those players stuck together, and they created some change over there. And so once again, the issue comes back to the same thing. It comes back to power. It comes back to who has it, who doesn't, and how they maximize it. But you're 100% right. When we think about the integration of these universities, people say to me all the time, imagine how different the culture would have been if those powerful, talented black athletes, instead of going to Arkansas and North Carolina and Georgia and UCLA, Imagine if they stayed and they went to Howard and stayed at the HBCUs, how different the balance of power would have been. There were a couple more people who had questions. This man back here has had his hand up the whole time and All we right. never got to answer him. Can we just, just do one, one or two more? We can just do one or two more. Okay, like I said. I've, <laughs> and I know this man that's asking the question, so I, I wouldn't mind Skip's telling him. Skip's been no, avoiding but, me, but, don't worry. <laughs> but that's okay, Howard. I, I've got a question about the corporate side. Uh, Under Armour has been Nike's biggest competitor the last several years. And uh, about a year and a half ago, they had a, the leader, uh, CEO, came out with no, pro-Trump support. Blank, yes. And mm -hmm. Steph Curry, who's the leader of Under Armour's brand, can't push back. I'm just curious if you see any of the corporate motivation for Nike's ad campaign to be driving a wedge against Under Armour. I'm just curious about the motivation. A lot of motivation. We talked about this last night at dinner, and one of the motivations as well that the dean brought up that I thought was tremendous and I hadn't even thought of it was let's shift our bad reputation on, on labor, and let's gain a little bit on protest, on social justice. So the people who may not like the fact that we have sweatshops in China may like us a little bit better because we're supporting Colin Kaepernick. So there's always wheels on top of wheels, no question. And obviously another one of those wheels is, what does this do to our competition? No question about it. Yes, sir, this guy, this has head up, then we'll get one more. Yes, sir, right here. Right up here. Hold on, we've got to get the microphone to you so we can record it. Uh, my name is Shane. I'm real grateful that you're here. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to ask you something personal. If you can point to uh, incidents or uh, people or something in your 
heritage that um, that uh, gives you uh, something that you have today that causes you to dig as deep as you do? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I I think I've always felt like the the job of journalism is to we're in the business of asking questions. Our job, and I, one of the biggest things now that I'm old, <laughs> is, um, you know, it's different from 28 years ago when I got into the business, when I think we were still on the tail end of that Vietnam Watergate motivation for doing the job, which was to hold institutions accountable, to actually stand for the public. We get to ask questions of people that the public do not get to ask questions of. Today, I think a lot of kids in our business they want a TV show. They want to be famous. There's money in this business now. So I'm just part of another generation. And I think that also, I think for me, you know, growing up in the black community in Boston and being a huge sports fan, I think it was two things. I think one, every time I watched a game, whether it was the Celtics or the Patriots or whomever, you'd read the stories in the paper the next day and you'd be like, that's not what happened. That's not what I would have emphasized. And so there's an arrogance that comes with thinking that you have something to say that other people might like. And it also comes from wanting to give people in your communities or who, who feel something, even if it's not your community, people who call you and say, hey, I think this is important. And I think that it's really interesting the number of people who have something to say and don't feel like anybody's listening. And so I think that's part of our job, is to, is to give people an opportunity to say things and explore things that they feel are important. That's what we do. We serve them. Yes, right here. This got to be our final question right over here. Yes, right, yep, right here. I'm Megan. I'm a student here. Thanks for being here today. I think this will tie up the conversation that we've been talking about. So you've presented the problem that the NFL has been tappering with for a while now. What do you think is their solution? Do you think they'll be driven by the culture on the outside to change, or do you think they'll do an internal find an internal solution? Yeah, I think they're gonna fight. I think it's a good question, and I think they shouldn't fight. I think they should just relax and let everybody just do what they do. I think that the football players wanna play football, and I think they wanna support their communities, and I think that the fans wanna watch football, and I think that I think that the world is going to keep turning. I think the sun will come up tomorrow if everybody has a chance to say what they feel like they need to say. Um, I don't understand necessarily why there's not more outrage from the public that they're being manipulated on this military stuff. I think it's awful, and I don't think that they need to do it. I don't see any reason why the you know, why the Wisconsin National Guard needs to pay the Milwaukee Brewers $80,000 to sing God Bless America. If you want to sing God Bless America, sing God Bless America. But these are business deals. And I think that's problematic to me. And because they're business deals, I think that's part of the reason why these leagues are really digging their heels in, because there's money at the core of it. And I think that's the disappointing part of it, is that I think that these things are organic. If they're organic, then I don't think people would have a real problem with it. Um, there's room for everything, and that's supposedly what makes us different than everyone else, and if there's not room, then we're moving in some really dangerous territory, and I think that's one of the reasons why people are watching what's going to happen with the NFL. What are they going to do? How are the players going to respond, and what are the owners going to do if the players respond? And I, and I think that at the end of the day, I think that we're, as a public, I think we're mature enough to handle all of it without being told what to do. Let's uh, thank Howard Bryant for being here.